my role is the director of new business development for American Sensor Technologies. And I go out and seek opportunities where we can use our technology and our products to satisfy customer requirements in a harsh environment, a harsh media, or in particular like applications like oil and gas, power generation, and, and other applications which require demanding sensors, yeah. for example. Great. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that um, you've had in developing sensors for subsea applications? Sure. Um, in subsea applications, there are many, many ch uh, challenges, particularly uh, the biggest one is reliability over a period of time. Many of the end users, uh, mm -hmm. typically people are using uh, offshore platforms or Christmas trees mm -hmm. or subsea structure monitoring. Yeah. They want to make sure that units can survive for 20 years or 30 years yep. with no maintenance, no service. Yep. So the challenge is how do you make a reliable product yep. uh, with using the right materials, the right formats and things like that, mm -hmm. that you can offer that kind of reliability yep. and performance over the very long period of time. So I know that one of the, uh, one of the things that you need to think about with these sensors is standards and these are becoming increasingly more important. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of standards and how you work with those? Sure. Um, in the standardization is not like universal. Mm -hmm. For example, in North America, we have the CSA, the UL mm -hmm. standards, which are tied up with the NEC and CEC. In Europe, we have ATEX, yep. uh, which is the um, European standard. Yep. And then the Far East, like Australia, they use IECEX. Mm -hmm. Now, IECEX is actually the international standard, and then ATEX and North American standards are derived from it. Mm -hmm. However, because of the geographical locations and needs, yeah. that's why you have the regional uh, part of ATEX and uh, North American standards. And then on top of that, we have standards going into like safety level, mm -hmm. which is now called SIL2, yep. uh, minimum for sensors right now. Yep. Here we're looking at uh, integrity levels of safety, mm -hmm. that if a device was to fail, what yep. mode the device will fail. Yep. And they want to make sure it doesn't cause any damage to a system mm -hmm. or loss of life or things like that. And then last but not least, as we get into material mm -hmm. side of it, there are standards coming from the materials, for example, MRO, yeah. uh, the NACE standard MRO 175, ISO 15156.3, mm -hmm. pretty much are now starting to dictate what kind of materials, what kind of environments you should use. Mm -hmm. So for example, stainless steels are being very limited mm -hmm. under the standard. So you start looking at like hydrogen sulfide, should I use inconels, yeah. should I use asteroid? And then when you talk about chlorides, yeah. Then we're talking about, uh, again, what kind of materials like Hesloys. Mm -hmm. uh, Inconels and Hesloys are typically trade names, yeah. but they're really the base materials. They come from a, what we call nickel-rich super alloys. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit more on those exotic materials and, and what they're, they're doing to your design process? Sure. For example, these exotic materials, what I would call are the non-stainless mm -hmm. families. Uh, these are typically nickel-based alloys, yeah. uh, what we call super alloys. Things like Inconel, Hesloy, mm -hmm. Vasploy. These alloys are very much uh, brought on to handle some of the nastiness in the or the harsh air mm -hmm. environment, particularly dealing with toxic gases, toxic, we're talking about salts in the system, mm -hmm. uh, corrosion. And then uh, Vasploys are very good for erosion, for example. So we got corrosion, erosion, and then we got the toxic mm -hmm. gases. So these materials have, uh, play a very yeah. important part in census. Um, can you uh, expand a little bit on kind of your design capabilities? I know we're here in your New Jersey location, which is your location, which is fully integrated from design to manufacturing. Can you talk a little bit about how you know that, that works together for you? Sure. Um, this facility is fully integrated, yep. uh, what we call a vertically up facility, yep. so we can handle feasibilities yep. uh, for sensor design, sensor requirements. We can do materials research mm -hmm. here, we got material sciences, we have electronic engineers, mechanical engineers, yeah. and we have what we call transducer engineers here. Yeah. People who can put everything together. So from having a facility here, mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, gives us the opportunity to not just to handle feasibility, yeah. but also do prototyping, yeah. pilot production, and then the full production. And we can work in conjunction with the customer being mm -hmm. here at our facility, uh, which we welcome them anytime. Yeah. Or we can go and visit them where, wherever they are and then start working down here. So the facility here is an ISO facility. It's also an ABS approved 
CSA, UL, TOA yeah. approved because of the requirements and the mandates we need. It gives a really good uh, feeling to yeah. the customer and to us to work together with them in this facility. This is coming from OTC down in Houston. What trends do you see in signal processing for offshore communication? And what is the benefit of them? So sure, um, one of the things in offshore, um, as more and more sensors are being applied uh, to monitor conditions and also give uh, feedback to the yeah. systems, there will be uh, many wires used to bring the signal back. So the traditional way of bringing signal away is analog mm -hmm. in nature. That means more connectivity, more connectors, more yeah. cables. Hence, the size of the shelves yeah. of the connectors have become bigger. So the trend is now towards digital systems. Yeah. So the oil fields, as we have what we call land-based systems, yeah. are digital oil fields. Yeah. Same thing starting to apply on subsea. Yeah. So here we're talking about uh, digital highways on the, the seabed yeah. to reduce connectivity, cable size. So we're talking about CAI 443 yeah. bus. We're talking about RS-485 buses. So more of these are which are four-wire buses that mm -hmm. can connect up to 128 devices. So now you reduce your connectivity yeah. and you increase your throughput. And also with digital systems, you can control pretty much the yeah. speed rate you want information to be sent out. So this is a new trend and we'll see that it's not going to be means that the end of the analog, yeah. you'll still be analog, but the analog will be the minority side. Yeah. The trend will be more to use more digital systems. Okay. Can you tell us anything about how TEC con connectors play into communicating uh, through the BOP system and everything like that? Sure. Uh, sensors are the, the ears, the nose, the mm -hmm. eyes uh, that pick up the system. Then we need to bring the system back yep. some way to our system to control it, to yep. monitor it. And this is where the connectors play a very yep. uh, important part. Without the connectors, we can't yep. connect, so we don't have connectivity. Yep. So the connectors, either they're bringing the signal through uh, through what we call electrically or yeah. optically, they still uh, are very important, like yeah. the sensor. So whenever I talk about this application, I say sensor and connectivity yeah. solutions. So you're looking at this as a whole system. Without yeah. this, you cannot get the information. So the Seacon connectors, the Deutsch connectors, uh, play a very important part with our sensor to bring the information to the customer. Okay, great. All right, we have another few here going on to onshore applications. With onshore applications, what design challenges do remote oil fields face? Onshore, uh, one of the biggest challenges is cold climate because a lot of the oil in northern hemisphere uh, is operates a very cold ambient. In places like Siberia, yeah. Canada can go to minus 50. Vice versa, land-based systems in the tropics can see very high humidity, high temperature, uh, what we call very rainy environment, for yeah. example. So the ex two extremes of a challenges, yeah. particularly for materials, for sealing, uh, for also encapsulation, that we don't want any bugs in the traffic. So yeah. the sensors are, and the vice versa, we don't want the cold climate to kill the sensors or freeze things up. Yeah. So that's uh, so the both uh, are very very important. And so by using these, then you have the ability to not have to necessarily plan for one or the other, that they're able to endure you know, both spans? Sure. You want to have a device that is designed in a way yeah. that can operate in these extreme conditions. Yeah. So one of the examples we give you is when we have a data sheet on the product, mm -hmm. we say the product's rated from minus 40C yeah. or minus 40F yeah. To 185C or yeah. 185 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. That means we are taking into consideration mm -hmm. from extreme cold to extreme heat yeah. and humid conditions. Yeah. So, as a sensor supplier or as a sensor mm -hmm. designer, we want to make sure this are incorporating the product. Yeah. As an end user, they want to have a product. They don't care where they ship to. Yeah. They don't have to segregate the inventory. They don't yeah. have to worry about this. So they got one product can be shipped globally. And along with this product, they want one product with global certification. Yeah. So if you're shipping it to Russia, you're shipping it yeah. to Canada, to Australia, you have the certifications, the yeah. approvals, and you have the package to go with it. Great. All right. Another question here from OTC. Fracking operations require very high pressure. Does AST make sensors that can operate at those pressures? Sure. Whenever you have a driller well, the next process is to frack it. Mm -hmm. And when you frack them, you're typically operating at 10,000 to 15,000 
feet below yeah. and a very narrow seam and you defrack it. So what are you doing? You see pumping a lot of liquid, yeah. uh, which is water and you hear about fracking yeah. and you basically it's a water base, could be some chemicals in them, some mud in them. The idea is to frack the rock, break the rock so that yeah. the oil can be gathered or the gas could be gathered. So you talk about very high pressures generated by pumps yeah. and these pumps are typically between a thousand and three thousand yeah. horsepower pumps yeah. and they have a lot of energy and uh, with with these uh, pumps you get you can generate very high pressure yeah. so with the pumps when you generate high pressure you get high cavitation you get high vibration you get high pulsation in the system okay. so even though you, the pump may be operating at 5000 psi uh, at the bottom level, the top level is pumping at 10 to 20,000 mm -hmm. psi. You, so you can get lots of yep. uh, pulsation, cavitation. Cavitation is a killer for sensors because you got high frequency noise that can come and interfere yep. with the system. So it's at, we do make sensors. We do supply to these pumps right now yep. for what we call mud pumps, frac pumps, and they have to survive this kind of pressure. So typically a 20,000 psi unit M yeah. must be able to supply 40,000 PSI with yeah. no problem. And those are pretty extreme conditions. Oh sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to be near them when no. something goes wrong. No. Yeah. I think we have one more question then, uh, Kristen, that came in. Yep. This one brings both onshore and offshore together. So can AST's explosion-proof and intrinsically safe sensors be used both on and offshore in the same configuration? Sure. Uh, when we do make two types of products, what we call explosion proof, the Europeans call flame proof. Yeah. They are used on offshore platforms along with intrinsically safe products. Now, in this class one, zone one, or division one, yeah. both products are used. It really depends on the installation. If the installation is an explosion proof mm -hmm. or flame proof, then you do not use intrinsically safe. Mm -hmm. Here, the sensor is integrated into a conduit or a piping mm -hmm. system that it does not allow any flame to get in or a flame to get out. In systems where you don't have rigid connectivity, you have flexible connectivity through cables or flexible cable, then you, you one will use an intrinsic safe. There, you're relying on the barrier, yes. which is a safety barrier. Typically, these are zener, diode, and resistor barrier with a fuse built in. If there is too much current consumed, there's a problem, it will just burn the fuse and it'll cut the supply to the unit. So intrinsically safe, what we call in the US, mm -hmm. the Europeans call it explosion proof. Okay. What we call explosion proof in the US, the Europeans call it flame proof. So there is a terminology yeah. difference, but I'm trying to understand what is what is yeah. uh, extremely important. So yes, we do make both units that can go on the plat offshore platforms, land-based, uh, 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 sea-based platforms, mm -hmm. but they are, and also with the global approvals. Mm -hmm. So that allows us to handle these applications nicely. Well, uh, I think that's what we have for questions. Thank you so much for your time. You're what welcome. we'll do is we'll leave this event page open, uh, and you can come back to us with any questions you have. We'll make sure Karmja gets them, and we'll make sure we get some answers for you.